Hi, everyone, and welcome to our final session for the becoming of the Lord. We're shifting our focus this week because we're not in Advent anymore. We're not in Kansas anymore. No, <laughs> we're, we're not, not even in Queens College we're, anymore. We're, we're, not, yeah, I'll that in a second. We're, uh, we're shifting our focus from the season of Advent to the season of Christmas. So uh, this week we're talking about preaching promise and challenge of Christmas, and as you can already see, in a bit of a different locale, uh, we have uh, forsaken the Zoom, and we're here live in person, three people in the same room for a conversation, which we're really excited about. Uh, my name is Reverend Robert Cook, and I'm the Director of Outreach Programs and Lecturer at Queen's College Faculty of Theology. Along with me, as always, is Reverend Dr. Glenn Mercer. He is Provost of Queen's College and an expert in all things homiletical. <laughs> we're glad to have her with us. And we're, I, I would say, the most pleased that we are about any conversation that we've had in this whole series. No offense to anybody who's come before, but we're really excited to have Kathy Sheldon with us today, uh, which I call the living legend. <laughs> and I'm just going to give her a, a second to tell us a little bit about herself. My name is Kathy Sheldon, as you said, and if I am a legend, I'm just an old one. <laughs> <laughs> and I, we are now in Lane's retirement home, where my husband and I moved a month ago, abandoning our beloved home, which we sold last week, in Virgin Arm on New Orleans, where we lived for 58 years, where he, he was a family doctor. And uh, you were I, a licensed lay minister. I was a she licensed cares. lay minister, and I had lots of opportunities to do things in the community and in the church for which I am enormously grateful and grateful to be here with these two old friends. <laughs> old friends, yes. And I, for me, when I think about lay ministry in the church, it's Kathy's face that I see. <laughs> so that's really why we want her to be part of this yeah, conversation. So we're going to start off. I have a question that I'm going to put to um, Joanne and Kathy, and I want all of you to think about it as well, those of you who will be preaching on, on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, maybe. Um, what makes a good Christmas Eve sermon? What makes a good Christmas Eve sermon? I don't know if either one of you want to go first to answer, try and answer that question. Well, I'm, I think it's important to have a Christmas Eve sermon. <laughs> Um, I, have a, I, have a I think you need to sort of think about it. It'll depend on your congregation. Lots of times you're welcoming people. Some people, you know, go to church at Christmas, Easter, and funerals and weddings. And so it's an opportunity uh, to present the gospel in a very positive kind of way. Um, so I think, you know, that is uh, important as well. Um, I think you had a couple of ideas of what made a good Christmas Eve sermon, Kathy. Well, I think I've only preached once, maybe twice on Christmas Eve when the priest got laryngitis in Christmas Eve. <laughs> um, I think you have to be aware of where you are and who's there, although, as they pointed out, we get lots of new people who are there. So make it short and to the point, but joyful and positive so that people go out with some understanding of the reason we do this on Christmas Eve. Which is getting a little bit lost in society that we are in now. Yeah, and I think if you know, so knowing what your message is, like knowing your, what your focus is, and get, doing it quickly and to the point in a in a joyous, welcoming manner. And I said, I mean, it's not a treatise. <laughs> no, I would say too. It's um, I've heard uh, clergy say before that the Christmas story speaks for itself. I don't know. I don't think it does because you're talking about a first century uh, narrative that's wrapped up in all kinds of theological and even say mythological language that doesn't uh, translate very well. I don't think over into 21st century, you know, technological society that we live in. So, I, as important as I, I think it is to read the story, I think we need to speak into the story as well and connect stories. Is what we were talking just before we pushed record. The connecting uh, the biblical story with the church's story, with my story as the preacher, or you know your story as the preacher, but then the story of, of culture, like what's going on in the world right now, uh, that we can give people to, uh, to take away with them something that they can walk out the door with. 
uh, that we're not just talking about some historical or mythological events within the LUV story that happened a long time ago, but this is something that's a, a present day reality that I think is participatory in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I think those are some of the merits of a, a good Christmas Eve sermon. Yes, certainly, sure. <laughs> Which is challenging. That itself is challenging. Well, because you have to know what you want to say. Well, yeah. Can I just say, Robert, uh, I don't think you can make the assumption in this day and age that everybody knows the Christmas story. Definitely yeah. not. I have dragged young people to church with me on Christmas Eve who did not know it. Now, they may have heard of it somewhere, mm -hmm. but they weren't completely familiar with the story as we have it in church. So you have to, have to be aware of that. Oh, and, um, I know from teaching religion years ago, none of this is now taught in schools. Yeah, so you have to be careful to tell a little bit about what it is you're there for. <laughs> yes, and, and, it, and it is a powerful story. Yeah. Yeah. And it has meaning you write for today. It's not a story of the past, it's about what God's doing today. And I think, you know, that's helping people see that. Yeah. And there's, there's, Probably getting into some of the textual things we're going to talk about now, but it's a it's a subversive story, and as much as I think society may feel it's lost, the, the story that we too in the church we're so familiar with these stories and texts that sometimes we miss what's right in front of us, right? Which is probably a good segue into some of the things that we were talking about before. So, um, and in, in particular, some of the things that Kathy had on her mind that she wanted to talk about. So, this is a good segue into now what you wanted to, to talk about. Well, when Reverend Joanne sent me the lessons, I had both the Luke Gospel, which is the story of Mary and Joseph, or Bethlehem, and the Johnson, John's Gospel, the first chapter, which I never made any connection with very much when I was in church on Christmas Eve to tell you the truth. It all sounded a bit too academic and philosophical. Is that the right yes, word? Yes. And then two weeks ago, my granddaughter took us downtown and we saw all the Christmas lights up on every building and on every house. Uh, we, we live at the top of this retirement home. We can look out over the city. Lights everywhere. So I came home and I decided to read these two Gospels and see which I was going to choose. Well, strangely enough, I chose the John's Gospel because <laughs> I picked up my grandmother's King James Bible, which is translated a little bit differently, and I came across this passage. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. I looked at the NIV and said, we did, and the darkness was not understood, which is not the translation in the newer versions, which says the darkness was not overcome, which is a wonderful, positive message. But this really showed me that we don't understand the darkness. And we haven't for a long, long time. You know, uh, we don't even see it. We don't see it, but we see it every night on our televisions. Mm -hmm. uh, in the world, we should be enormously grateful, although we could dispute the date, <laughs> that we have this at the darkest time of year. We're given this gift from it's been so foggy and awful recently, <laughs> where we can put up lights and have a joyful celebration. It's a gift to us. It's a real gift to us. But we not do we really comprehend what's going on? And it, you know, there there's so many dark stories and as I told Joanne and Robert, I started thinking about the darkness, the stories we see a lot now, that were just swept under the carpet when I was young. I, I'm from the South. So racism, you know, um, indigenous rights, LBGTQ issues, uh, uh, domestic violence. I have a friend who said any time any of those were mentioned in her home, her mother said, don't mention it. And thank goodness those things are coming to light and the people who suffered so terribly from all of these things, we're having to pay attention to now. We're having to bring some light to that. And so I read the other day that Christmas is not a celebration, it's a choice. We can choose to see the light 
and to not only choose to see it, but to look for it. We are the children of the light. It says right there in the gospel, in John's gospel that God created all of us to be the light. It's a tall order. Yeah, and I mean, I like the notion of reading both, the idea that the darkness can't comprehend. I looked up the Greek and it had a sense of the darkness can't grasp it. And I sort of think it has both that sort of meant it can't, the, the darkness doesn't understand the light. We don't see it, we don't understand it. But the darkness also cannot, uh, cannot uh, uh, grasp it, cannot put it out, cannot overcome it. Um, so I like that idea of having the book that we live sometimes uh, in dark, we feel we live in dark, dark times, but the, there's a light that that is stronger than the darkness. And that there is a truth that, you know, that these truths now, these realities that you talked about, you know, have come out and are being spoken about and are given the attention that they deserve. And I think that's really important for us in terms of seeing that the Christmas message is is about us now, right? It's not that Jesus was the light or John was the light and, and we're just basking in its glow, that we're called to be, like you said, that we're all called to be that light, we're all called to shine the light, the love of God and to recognize that within us, even when we may not think that we have any. I love the story you were telling us when we were setting up about when you gather for things here uh, at the, the retirement home and how you see light. I don't know if you want to share. Yes, I'm that. not giving you a chance to speak about your portions at least. Um, we moved into this retirement home, which has three sections an independent living section, an assisted living section, and a personal care. We have people here with every kind of disability, mental and physical. And we have a wonderful director of uh, two, two actually, program directors. And they put all of us together for everything. And it gives you a view of what some of these things mean to people who, who do live in, in the shadow of darkness, lots of, of dementia of patients. And when we get together and the music comes, they get up and dance. People who can't feed themselves, who don't know where they are, don't know which room they're in, can sing every word to every song. And it's a joyful occasion when you see them transformed into light. And it's been a real eye opener for, for us um, here to see that happen and to many other people who are here to see what giving people a space to be joyful and to celebrate the difference it makes in their lives. And I think it speaks well to the notion that so in some ways, darkness and lightness, lightness um, aren't really opposite from one another, right? So people might look at someone and say, oh, they don't have anything, you know, to offer. But when you put us in music, you see a completely different person, that we're not all one thing or the other. And, and that the ability to see that, right? And uh, so thinking about the Isaiah reading, too, for Christmas, and that sort of notion of, of praising God in the midst of a difficulty, in the midst of trial, in the midst of war, in the midst of pain, and giving praise to God in the midst of all of that, and how transformative that is, right? And it goes back to what you said earlier about being able to see the light. And, uh, it, you know, if we're in your house now, we can't see the light. <laughs> but, like, you know, in a few hours, not very many, so, and this summer here, like, you'll be able to, you'll see all those pieces of light, right? And so they are one part, uh, the darkness and light are part of each other. And uh, there is a lot to celebrate. Well, I think the, going back to what I said earlier, but <clears throat> these stories being subversive. Mm -hmm. They're still subversive because as much as we don't, we say the, the world doesn't comprehend, we <laughs> often don't comprehend. And when I say we, I mean the, the church. We. We tend to think that we are the keepers of the light. We have the light here, and everybody has to come in and get it. Whereas what Kathy is saying is that the light is in unexpected places, right? And we need to have eyes to see it and hearts to embrace it and, and you know, the hands and feet to join in what's going on with the light, right? Because 
these stories, um, you know, this, the, the Luke story and the, and the John story too, I think are the same story just told from different perspectives. Yes. One is on the ground in the midst of it, and one is more of a cosmic, more philosophical tone of the story. But the stories are so surprising. They're so familiar to us, but they're so surprising in where God shows up, right? In a little vulnerable, poopy baby, <laughs> right? <laughs> in, 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 a, in, a, in a stable. And sh it's shepherds, the, the lowest of the low, who come and hear this good news for the first time, right? So, and when it's, when that story is, is uh, juxtaposed against like where the light and maybe you might even say power uh, and you know, salvation is located in that first century world, it was with Herod, right? He was the king of the Jews. And this story is saying, no, he's not the king of the Jews, right? Uh, um, Caesar is the son of God and the salvation of the world. No, it's this little baby that is the salvation of the world. It's not in power and domination. It's in um, vulnerability and selflessness that salvation comes, right? That's still a radical message today. And it's not, it's one that I still, I think the church still struggles with as well, right? That the story, you know, our story is not written in power and domination, but it's written in weakness and in selfless love. And that's a story that I think can still resonate in the world. We're talking to you know, what people need to hear when they come to church Christmas Eve. Uh, I think we're in a society now where people are beat down, beat down, beat down all the time. You know, go to work, come home, get a paycheck, you know, get by, survive, surround yourself with stuff that is going to make you fill the void. Well, no, it doesn't. So this story tells us that our salvation, our liberation, the light is somewhere else. It's not in those things that the world tries to sell us. It's in community. It's within us. It's within us. It's one of the things I was reading in preparation uh, um, talked about us that it's not just Mary called to bear the Christ, that we're all midwives, right? We're all midwives trying to bear Christ. Like it's not that God chooses Mary and Mary alone, but God chooses every single one of us. And every single one of us are asked to bear that light, to bear the Christ, to give witness to it, um, you know, that God is with us, that God's grace um, is with us, that, that we, are not, uh, we are not abandoned, we are not alone, we are not left uncomforted. Even that feminine imagery of birthing yes. is still culturally not a story that we would generally Except, right? We're still very male dominated. Oh. Right? So the, to have a. That you feminine, go ahead and think that. <laughs> <laughs> but, the fem, but the feminine imagery of birthing, and that's not just, but we're, we're all birthing. All the time. Right? We're all birthing. And, you know, when you started talking about us, thinking about it, the spirit, which Luke talks about a lot of Luke's gospel, and it's in the uh, the whole narrative story too, first narrative story too. But the spirit in that scenario becomes more of a midwife, right? And some of the more masculine imagery sometimes is referred to the, to the spirit, which is very kind of power centered. This is more like calling forth and encouragement and sitting alongside of and holding hands and you know, kind of bringing that new light into the world, right? Well, there are a lot of opportunities to say yes, like Mary did, but they don't always appear to be very comfortable or acceptable to us. And you know we uh, we have run away from some of those in the church. We've run away from some of those desperately. Mm -hmm. You know we've been a bit smug. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very. We had the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And the answer. Yes. Which may have been outside our door somewhere. Yes, and we couldn't see the light. We light was around us all the time, and we comprehended it not. <laughs> I think that uh, there is something very powerful about that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is really Christmas preaching. Christmas can be an invitation to comprehend, uh, an invitation to see the light when you don't expect it, an invitation to recognize it, an invitation to see the light within yourself. I, I just want to add one other thing that I have seen in the rural area. I don't know if you see it so much in the city, but there was a time when our denominations were so separate and so critical of one another. And in the last five, eight years, 
we have begun to realize that we are the Christian faith, the Christian people. And lots of things have come together where we can work together and where we're going to have to if we're going to survive. And that, that's a little bit of life, too. So look for it. Like I said, there's all kinds of things, yeah. things that we sometimes think of as darkness, right? So uh, the, the recognition that we need one another, recognition that we need God, that we're not self-sufficient, that all this stuff is not going to make us feel better. Um, you know, those are all pieces of light, really. Yeah, I think, again, my theme, like, you know, over and over, not only this, this, these stories for this week, but all day, is the subversiveness of the story that calls us to look at things in a different way, look at ourselves in a different way. Like I was saying this morning, we often read these stories as if we're the good guys. But I think if you look at the context of the stories of the Lucan story and Matthew story, um, you know, we're more on the side of the oppressors than on the oppressed. But I mean, I think at, at the heart of the stories is still liberation, right? But maybe what we need to be liberated from is our, you know, self-denial. Who we are, and perhaps we play and, and, and the whole binary notion, yeah. right? That there's good and bad, and powerful and non powerful, and those are just things we fall into. Really, when, when God chooses to break the barrier between humanity and divinity, and I think everything else falls apart. God chooses to become human, God chooses to be incarnate. Um, then, how do we sort of that what, what barrier is left? I like that word that you picked up from the Advent um, thing you recently did, Steve Bell and Jimmy. No, no, no. The, the, with me. Yeah, with yeah, with, yeah. That Christmas is not a bit about witness. Is about witness. Witness. W i t h. Yeah, the God is with us. Yeah. yeah. And I think the going back to Kathy's story, but here in this context, it aims the witness of community. Coming together, uh, and that's where the light is. Because if the light is in me, and it's in you, and we come together, well, then that light yeah. is that much brighter. Right? So, the witness not only with God with us, but us with, with each other. With each other. And uh, if you're talking about a message that could resonate in our world today, it, that, I think it's that the connectedness. Because we hear all the time that you know an epidemic of loneliness social isolation, all those kinds of things, um, that the, the interconnectivity of, of not just us, but with all creation, and the sense of community, I think, is something that really resonates and people feel disconnected. One of the things in the last few years that kind of I've used a lot in my preaching was overwhelming. Jesus didn't go to big collective places and, like synagogues and churches. He walked the roads and encountered Everybody he met, everybody he met. I think it was only the woman who said he from the dogs mm -hmm. <laughs> at the table. She 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 upbraided him about his his uh, she enlarged his view of who was going to be part of the community. But he never met somebody he didn't respond to. No, there's a lot for us to learn in that. A lot for us to come. Well, in. we we tend to retreat into our churches or into our institutions. And we view ourselves as, this might sound a bit irreverent when I say this, but we, we, we turn ourselves into Jesus dispensaries, <laughs> right? <laughs> that you have to come here. Again, like we mentioned, you have to come here. Jesus is here. Yeah. Whereas we know when we read the Gospels, as Kathy said, that's Jesus. not where Jesus is. <laughs> There's nowhere where right? Jesus is not. Right. <laughs> He's out there. He's wild. Yeah. Uh, right? So, you know, I think that idea of um, shifting our focus away from from here to out there, which makes it very practical, very tangible, which again, I think is a message people need to hear. We're not calling people to some kind of, you know, leave the world, forsake the world, leave the world behind, and, you know, accept Jesus into your heart, but take it out there into the world. There's your Christmas sermon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much, Kathy. Well, it's been, been a wonderful. great pleasure to see both of you. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I always like when we get close to these big um, celebrations in the church, just caution people, uh, clergy, take care of yourselves, get rest, 
this uh, the season of Advent and build up to Christmas is um, they say it's stressful. I mean, <laughs> a lot of stuff going on. So make sure uh, in the craziness uh, of all the stuff that goes on in the church, find time for rest, find time to be with your family, uh, whatever shape, size uh, your family comes in, and uh, you know, look at the light. And look at the light. And I would say. In my mind, the story is not over with Christmas. It's just the beginning. And really, Christmas is another doorway into Epiphany. Mm -hmm. so maybe, Might be a new beginning for us if we say so. Right. <coughs> maybe we Always. need to do preaching with Christ and challenge of Epiphany <laughs> as well. Anyways, uh, thank you all for being with us through this series. And uh, have a wonderful Merry Christmas. Yes. Merry Christmas. Happy May. And we wish you all a joyful time of Christmas. And the one thing I feel sad about, all our years in the rural area, we celebrated 12 days of Christmas mm -hmm. after Christmas. Mm -hmm. So that's when you can have your rest and your fun. Uh, that's right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Keep mm -hmm. the 12 days of Christmas, Kathy, is saying. Yes. <laughs> I'm with you on that. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye.